welcome back. I know that I've been out for the last two weeks. I was overseas during that period and I was unable to be with you and I'm sure that you enjoyed the program while I was away. I asked comrades uh, Adrian Anamaya and Dharam Kumar Siraj to substitute for me. So I trust that you had a good, you had two good programs in my absence, but I am back and we have so many things to discuss tonight. Um, I want to begin by apologizing for my late start, but this is as a result of engagements which I've had in Region 6. I just completed a big public meeting in Topu where a lot of people attended, many, many residents from Albion Front, from Reef, and from Guava Bush, from Topu itself. And I had with me um, the Vice Chairman of the region, Cobra Dennis De Roop, and other regional officials. And we met with the residents where a number of important issues were raised by the residents and I was able to uh, uh, interact with them, record their complaint and where possible advised on how we can move uh, the process forward in terms of addressing successfully and effectively the concerns raised. So I will be doing follow-up meetings with those people to ensure that our discussions were not futile and that it can bear some fruit that will benefit the community and the welfare, welfare of the residents of that area. I then proceeded to Blackbush, my Bikuri, Blackbush, where I met with the relatives of the three persons who were so brutally murdered recently in the Bagdam the father, his son, and his brother-in-law. I just came from the week uh, in my Bikuri where I met with the family to express my deepest condolences on behalf of the People's Progressive Party, on behalf of the General Secretary, on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, and to console them in whatever way that we can at this point in time when they are going through such disaster, pain, emotional trauma and everything else that goes with the death of three young people in one family. Um, tomorrow will be the funeral and um, hopefully our General Secretary, Comrade Clement Rohi, will be attending the funeral on behalf of the party. So those are the two events which account for my late arrival here this evening. But the issues that I want to deal with are so many that I am not sure that I can deal with them all on this one program. But we can begin with the crime situation. The government continues to say to the population that crime is on the decline. They continue to say that crime in Region 6 is on the decline. The Minister of Home Affairs, or now Public Security, Kamrat Ramjatan, continues to assure the nation that he has control and the police force have control of the crime situation. But we are met with these gross and violent uh, killings right across the length and breadth of our country on an almost daily basis. On the East Bank, somebody was murdered and put in a wardrobe. In Blackbush, East Bank of Demerara, in Blackbush you have this triple murder. Then you have
have banditry, you have robberies, you have thieves, right across the length and breadth of the country. But we have a government that is telling us that they have the crime situation under control. My difficulty is, it's not that this criminal conduct started under this government, I'm not saying so at all. But we have to recognize a problem before we can solve it. This government's major, major uh, flaw in their analysis of anything is that they do not, they refuse to, they fail to, they neglect to recognize problems, whether it is in relation to crime, whether it is in relation to the economy, whether it is in relation to some social issues, rather than accept that there is a problem and tell the country that there is a problem and then ask for assistance if you can't address the problem. But you cannot deny the problem. If you deny that the problem exists, then there will be no efforts to address the problem. Because according to you, there is no problem. So the problem will continue to perpetuate, it will continue to fester, and it will eventually multiply and get worse. And that is what is happening with the economic issues in the country, with management issues in the country, with social issues in the country, and with the crime situation. And on top of that, we have a president who continues to administer pardons to convicted criminals and refuses to explain the process by which he is doing so. He refuses to give the names of the people who he is pardoning. He refuses to tell us what process he uses in determining who will be pardoned. He refuses to tell us the antecedents of these persons. He refuses to tell us what offenses they have been convicted for. He refuses to tell us how, what length of imprisonment they are currently serving. These are all questions that I ask in the National Assembly but the Speaker of the National Assembly has denied me the right to ask those questions and, have, and has rejected my questions as being inadmissible. In other words, that they are not permissible. It is not permissible for me, a member of Parliament, representing thousands of people, to ask such a question. I don't want to know that information for my own personal benefit, edification, or archive. I want to know that because you, the people, have asked me to ask that. Because you, the people, want answers to those questions. Many telephone calls I have received on this very television program ask me those questions because we were told that the president says that he is only pardoning persons who have committed minor non-violent offenses. But we found out in Barbies that a gentleman who was the recipient of a pardon robbed and beat somebody in Rose Hall and was arrested and convicted again and then it was realized that his previous conviction was in relation to robbery with violence. So when the president says to the nation that he is pardoning only persons who have been convicted of minor offenses of a non-violent nature that is not the truth. 
I don't want to accuse the president of lying, but I am saying to you that when he says that, that is not factual. Because this, the incident, the story that I just told you about is real and that person was a pardonee. He was the recipient of a pardon and he was convicted. When the investigations were done, it was found that he was convicted of a violent crime, robbery with violence. So you have that that is compounding, that approach which is compounding the crime situation in the country. And maybe contributing, certainly not helping, contributing to a continuous escalation of criminal conduct, especially of a violent nature, right across the length and breadth of this country. Then another issue, so that's one, the other issue that I want to talk about is the issue with the stray catcher. Now, recall two weeks or a few weeks ago on this program, in this studio, I had about a dozen farmers from Reliance and Kanji and they complained live on television about the harassment and the treatment to which they are being subject at the hands of street catchers. They outlined in great details that they are actually attending to their animals, that their animals are in open spaces and pastures, but yet, and not on the public roadways, but yet the street catchers would come chase the animals away from them, although they are standing right there, take the animals to the pond at Reliance Police Station and then demand from those farmers huge sums of money. This is not me saying so. The farmers themselves came here and they spoke to you. Uh, two or three of them said that they have paid as much as one million dollars each in pound fees. Now that is an extraordinary amount of money for poor small cattle farmers to pay. As a result, they are selling out their stocks. When they sell out their stocks, they lose a source of income in an already depressed and depressing economy. When I went into Topu this afternoon, again, I was confronted by a whole host of small farmers from Guava Bush, from Albion Front, and from Topu itself, where the farmers are complaining bitterly again about the conduct or against the conduct of these stray catchers. The story is similar. Someone sent to me a video which I posted on my Facebook page of stray catchers attempting to arrest a young boy, a minor, attempting to put him, drag him into a car because he was attending to his animals. And he resisted them when they, he went home for his father, when they attempted to impound the animal. And then the entire community came out and there was somewhat of a confrontation between the community and the street catchers and the police. Hopefully it did not descend into violence and we are happy about that. 
but go on my Facebook page, type in my name, and you will see the video and look at it for yourselves. Well, today I met with those very people and they were explaining to me about the conduct of these uh, stray catchers. I had to leave the country so not much was done about the reliance situation. Now we have Albion developing into a problem in relation to this pounding of animals. So we will have to take decisive actions and take those actions very, very early. So I will speak to my colleague, Adrian Anamaya, who will address this matter by filing legal proceedings for wrongful impounding of animals. And we will deal with the situation because it appears as though these stray catchers they want to challenge me. They want to flout the law. They want to exploit people. They want to extort money from people. Because that is what is going on. That is the allegation. Those are the allegations that have been leveled against them. So we will face the challenge and we will go to the court. That's issue number two. Issue number three, I want to talk a little about local government and the impediments that our NDCs and RDCs are facing throughout the country. Now, as you know, we won seven of the ten regions in the country at the last local government elections and we tied in certain NDCs. We also won several municipalities. Sorry, we won seven of the ten regions at the regional elections, at the national elections. Then at the local government elections, we basically won and now most of the NDCs and municipalities throughout the country. So the PPP ought to be controlling the local government machinery. Well, this government has devised a series of systems, mechanisms, and are employing a number of strategies to frustrate and to prevent our councillors at every level, be it at the municipality or at the regional level or at the NDC, they have devised a series of strategies and mechanisms which they are employing to prevent us from delivering service to you the people of the regions and the people of the NDCs. And that was what I was confronted with in Topu. Could you imagine, firstly, strategy number one, stifle the financial resources so that the councils and the NDCs have no money to spend. That's their first strategy. Imagine since February, we in the National Assembly approved budgets, the national budget and budgets for all the regions and all the NDCs throughout the country since February. March, April, May, June, July, seven months. And these budgetary sums have not yet been received by any of the regions or any of the NDCs. Minister Volkan has so far omitted, neglected or refused to disburse the monies approved by the National Assembly to go to the regions so that the region 
can perform services for you, the people. So the regions all around the country have no money because they have not received any money from central government. That's one. Two, the REOs who are agents of the government, they are agents of the local government minister at the regional level and the overseers at the NDC level are being used to frustrate the functioning of the councils, both at the RDC level and at the NDC level. These are the two ministers' agents, and they are used, manipulated, and used to frustrate the council from discharging its functions. So in Region 6, you have Ramaya going slow on contracts and attempting to override decisions made by the council. Let me explain that the REO is like the clerk of the region. The overseer is like the clerk of the NDC and their functions essentially are to give effect to the decisions of the council, the elected council. Because you elected the council. The council must run the region. The council must run the NDC, not the overseer and not the RU. And that is not being accepted by this government. So the RBO is being used as a frustrating weapon against the regional administration and the NDCs to prevent them from delivering goods and services to you. That is the second mechanism. The third mechanism is misbehavior of councillors both at the regional level and at the level of the NDC. We have an outstanding example in Region 5. Let us take Region 5. The issue is that the APNU AFC councillors are refusing to allow statutory meetings to take place until the chairman apologizes to the president for not attending a function to which the chairman was not invited. Could you imagine the foolishness? They are want to penalize the chairman for not attending a function to which the chairman was not invited. And they want the chairman to apologize. Well, firstly, he was not invited and therefore should not have shown up. And he didn't. He did the right thing. Secondly, whether the chairman should apologize to the president has nothing to do with the business of the council. That is not a council matter. And thirdly, you have seen their behavior on Facebook, on television, and you would have read about it in the newspapers. They lie down on the ground, on the road, at the entrance, so that the chairman can drive into the compound. They dance, they sing, they behave like lunatics. And they disrupt and bang the table whenever there is an attempt to have discussions. As a result, the council can't meet. But who is suffering? Who is suffering as a result of this? The entire region. So many hundreds and thousands of residents of Region 5 who voted for those very councillors are 
now suffering as a result of the conduct of those counselors. Because since the RDC cannot meet, many important decisions cannot be made. And as a result, many important services cannot be provided to the people of the region. Let me give you an example. One, important drainage canals, trenches, and drain, drain channels cannot be cleaned in the region. So you have constant flooding in Region 5. It results in losses of millions of dollars not only of PPP farmers, but of APNU farmers. So, and the region can do anything to alleviate the sufferings which result from these floods. I spoke to the regional chairman myself. He said in many instances he could have given gas, he could have given fuel, he could have given diesel to farmers to assist them with pumping out water, etc. But the region, but the region cannot approve the expenditures and therefore the entire region is stultified in its ability to deliver services to the region. So that's flooding. Secondly, we have Healthcare in the region. It is the region through the Ministry of Health that provides health care in the region. Region 5 has two hospitals and several health care centers. Because of the inability of the region to function, you have these hospitals not having drugs, not having adequate staff, and the health centers not having drugs and not having adequate staff. So who you think punishing and suffering as a result? Not only PPP people or PPP supporters, but all the people of Region 5. Then we come to education. It is also the region that has to provide in conjunction with the Ministry of Education services in relation to education for the region. I am told that many schools have problems, but these problems cannot be addressed, they cannot be rectified because of the region not meeting. We have a, there is a nursery school in Mortis Maikoni that is not functioning and the children, small nursery school children, are attending school at the headmistress's bottom house because the building can't be done. Why? Because the region cannot meet. Who suffers? The little children suffer. They don't know politics. They didn't vote for anybody. But they are now sitting at somebody's bottom house to attend school rather than have a building. That's four. Five contracts in the region cannot be properly scrutinized. They can be properly oversighted. And as a result, contracts are improperly awarded because the region can't be so the region can scrutinize what is going on in the region. Now that, those are only some of the problems that are confronted, that are caused by the failure of the region to meet. And why they can't meet? Because of the unruly indecent and disorderly behavior of APNU counselors and they are not being reprimanded 
they are not being sanctioned, they are not being admonished by their government. So the only conclusion that I can draw is that they are being supported by the government. So when this government tells you that it cares and it wants to provide a good life for all, well, don't provide a good life for all because you're not doing that. Just provide a good life for the people of Region 5 and call off a set of counselors who are behaving as though they are possessed with some or by some spirit. That's all you have to do. But that is not being done. And that, comrades and friends, are happening throughout. In Enmore, the APNU, AFC, only have two councillors at the NDC. Just two. Just two. The PVP, we have 16 and they have two. And these two councillors would go to the meeting and knock drum on the table and sing. Old MacDonald had a farm. Throughout the meeting, so as to frustrate the work of the council. And that is why I am saying to you that if they are not isolated incidents. They are deliberately orchestrated incidents. Because one is happening at Edmore, one is happening at, at um, uh, Region 5. And the people in Essequibo, I am told, are threatening to do the same at Anna Regina and at some other uh, local government uh, organs. So it is a clear and centralized orchestrated strategy to frustrate the works of the regions that we have won. And that is why I am telling you, it has to do about recognizing democracy. These people don't respect democracy. Why this thing is not happening in Linden? Why is that happening at, at, at Georgetown, where the important, important decisions Important matters are not even brought to the council. Even the, the deputy mayor had reason to say that he never heard about his parking meter contract. And it was already signed. You think that could have happened in a region where we have won? They would have burned the whole place down. They would have burned the whole place down. But there is a belief in this country that only one set of people can behave bad. But that is not so. That is a serious mistake that people are making. That only one set of people can behave in a particular way. That somehow or the other is one ethnic group in this country. That, it, that are capable of doing certain things. That's not true. Trust me, that is not true. So, those are some of the important issues that have dominated the news in regions 5 and 6 and of course in the country over the last couple of days or so. The other issue I want to speak about is the state of the economy. Now, every worker in this country, whether you are a sweeper, in a school or you are the chief executive officer of the largest company or the chairman of the biggest bank whether you're selling on the road or whether you're a cab 
rapid dyan. Whether you're driving speedboat for hire or whether you're conducting minibus. Whether you're a gold miner or whether you are a logger. Whether you're a rice farmer or whether you're a sugar worker. Whether you're a public servant or whether you're a lawyer in private practice or a doctor. Whichever field of endeavor you are from, whichever job you are doing, you and I know that the economy is underperforming. I spoke earlier about the refusal, the obstinate refusal of the government to address issues and accept reality and admit the problems. Well, I'm giving you another example. So, rather than, and why is there a downturn in the economy? First of all, the government is not ad admitting that. The government released some statistics to show increased production of gold. We know about the increased production of gold. The investments in relation to the gold sector came under our government. Every other productive sector is underperforming. But guess what? The government receiving more taxes. So they think that the economy is performing. Well, I don't know. I'm not an economist. I'm a lawyer. But I know sufficient common sense to know that if you increase taxes, 143 taxes by 1200% and more, you are going to get more revenue. But the fact that you're getting more revenue doesn't mean that the economy is growing at all. Evidence of growth of an economy comes from one, you look at whether there is increased investments, whether there is job creation, whether there is increased economic activity, whether there is increased spending power or disposable income, whether your productive sectors are performing, whether your dollar is withstanding fluctuation in value, all those things, none of those things are happening now. No jobs are being created. No new investment. The US dollar is now too. 13 for one so it's devaluing every day no salary increase but taxation across the board so leaving the consumer with less money to spend how can that result in, them, in, in economic growth the minister of finance was forced to accept that there has been a reduction in fact, a reduction in fact, by some 6%. You know why? Because VAT is the tax that is attached to spending. So you have less spending and therefore less VAT. That is why. All the other taxes increase, but VAT decreases. Because VAT is directly associated to economic activity. So you have a decline in economic activity. You have capital flight taking place in this country. People are moving their money out. Why? People are afraid. Soku running into people's house. Saru investigating people. I am told that a whole list, I wrote a whole article about it, have been submitted to certain places requesting people they, what properties they own how much money they have in their bank account 
They want to know that about PPP leaders. Well, we file our integrity, we file our returns with the Integrity Commission annually. We do that. 10 or 15 years now, we have been calling upon the opposition, the government when they were in opposition, to file their returns. They never did. But their names are not on the list. So if you want to know what I own, you pull my Integrity Commission form. And you will see the list of my assets and the list of my liabilities. And I was only a minister for two years. Everything I own, I own before. So I don't know what they're looking. I don't know what they're looking. I have been a lawyer for more than half of my life. So let them go and look. Each transport or title has a date. So if they feel that I amassed wealth in government, well they will find out that whatever I had, I had it before. I am not incompetent like them. I have been somewhat successful. But it's not about me. It's about the process. They are investigating a long list of PVP leaders, but not one of them have been called and, inf and, and, and informed that they are being investigated. We are reading in newspapers that we are being investigated. We are hearing on the streets that we are being investigated. So, they have, and, and, and what is sickening is the dismantling of the legal institutions in the country and substituting organizations that they control to do their investigations. And that is the subject of my article this week, where I will show that they are hiring their own auditors to audit you. So they are not using the Auditor General because they can't give the Auditor General directions. They are hiring Christopher Ram and Gul Saran. Can they could direct them? Find him guilty. Then they have their own investigators, not the police force, but so called SARU that they control. Now you heard that they want to set up their own prosecutions, so they're going to have their own prosecutors because they can't instruct Shalimar Alihak. And you know what's the next thing? They will appoint their own court. So from top to bottom, they will investigate you, they will prosecute you, and they will try you in their own court. These people are insane. They are insane if they think that that will ever happen in this country. But you will read my next article coming out this weekend, and that is what I intend to write about. The systematic dismantling of the rule of law. We have to take these things internationally. We have to bring in the United Nations and we have a struggle in this country over the next few years. And that is what Jadeo said to the people in New York. What he said to the people in New York, he said it here. I have been saying it here every Tuesday night. That there is discrimination. That there is victimization. We have been saying that all the time. Every television program. I have said that. I have spoken about the people who are home being taken away. I have spoken about the, 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 the so called targeting one set of people. I have spoken about one set of people's lands getting taken away. I have spoken about how many people getting dismissed of one ethnicity from Gaisuku. I have spoken about the hundreds of people dismissed from the public sector of one ethnicity. I have spoken about all of that here. But because Jandev said it in New York, I don't know what happened. Apparently they don't want it to be told outside. Anyway, I have to take some calls now. I am running out of time. So I have dealt with a lot of issues. But let's take some calls. Uh, the photos bring
you know the time. Call you on the air. Hi, good night, Mr. Manolai. Good time. What's going on? What? <laughs> What's going on? I'm going to tell you right now. You have to be going to have to be going to have to be going to have to be like trying to go and kill you tomorrow on me. I have to talk to you nonsense. Thank you. I, I didn't understand. I heard him say nonsense. I presume that he's saying that I, I am talking nonsense. Well, so be it. The reality is out there. I don't have to say much. I just have to highlight it. Call her over here. We lost that call. We lost that call. So, call her on the air. Hi, good night. Could you lower your television? Could you lower your television? Yes, good night. Hi, good night. Um, I call in concerning my line in Tofu. Yes, you were, you were at the meeting this afternoon? No, I was in work. And um, we have a whole set of people going in there. I have a foundation there. I have my they, my friends properly friends in and they open in again, putting the cattle inside. So what can I do with that? Well, those are cattle. If they are coming onto your private property, then they should, the cattle should be impounded. Those are fit and proper cases for impounding of cattle to take place. Oh. But I can't, I can't imagine that somebody will go and graze their cattle in your yard. When I open in the gate and I put in the cattle, the pig, everything in the yard. When I go and I talk in, then call is asking me. Alright, alright call it. thank okay. you. Okay. So you get a little glimpse of the other side of the story now. This lady is saying that, that people are opening her gate and putting animals to graze in her yard. Call her in here. Call her. We love that call. So, call you on the air. Good night, Mr. Anip. Hi. Good night, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. You know, one concern which let me off is our chairman for Portman NDC, Mr. Imran Ali. Yes. You know, he makes a lot of things bad about the opposition leader. This man operated the NDC from his house. He takes this letter, stamp and everything to his house and taken bribes to do building application and you know our president and our minister they're not doing this and Imran Ali is so corrupted at Fort Martin see. Mm -hmm. I'm begging you sir you know me I am begging you for our party's sake our mm -hmm. president our grandfather Dr. Jagan never did it and Mr. Imran Ali has taken away our reputation from our dignity of our Indian people thank you sir thank you all right so this, this caller is complaining about the chairman of the NBC. I will pass the concerns over. Thank you very much, caller. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. Good night, sir. Good night. How are you? Up to about. <laughs> this caller just wants to say good night to me. That's good. So, um... Caller, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello? Yes? I have one problem to me. Since this government is growing, this government don't pick up in Bushra anymore. Bushra, West Coast Bobbies? West Coast Bobbies. Alright. Houston, Texas, TMP, Chapter Park, I'll tell you the MEC. Well, you see the point that I was making just now. I list a set of things that can't happen in Region 5 because of the behavior of these councillors. All right? Yes, chief. Well, but only one set of areas are picking up garbage. Oh, so only one set of areas are picking up garbage. Yes. All right. Thank you for highlighting that. Um, I know that many of the councillors uh, are watching the program and um, I will communicate with the chairman myself. Okay. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this call is saying that only one uh, set of communities garbage are being picked up from. If that is so, that is discrimination and that's wrong. Caller, you're on the air. Hello, good night. Uh, good night. Um, I'm Connie from Arles, concerned my street. I'm living in Arles about 14 to 15 years now. 
And this street is straight in front village office. Yes. And you get some man who's normally fresh sand and then breaking up the dam and when the rain falls, you can't get to come out. And when them children ready to go to school, you got to actually hide them. Alright, which NDC this fall under? Alness. Alness has its own NDC? Yes. What's the name of the NDC? Um I can't really Anyhow, could you go and make a complaint? Once you live in the area, don't you know the councillors? Yes. Well, could you lodge a complaint with the councillors? Many times we um, get a group and we go in out and tell them. Uh -huh. Actually, like, fall in the dam with some um, sand or this um, kind of... This is a kind of thing they're falling it and when the rain falls, it's washing out back. All right. All right, Carla, thank you. I'll try to pursue it at the avenue of the... Um, the okay. regional democratic okay, council. because this this is making no sense. Okay, Carla. Okay. Well, you see, Bolkan has not released any money to the people. The minister has not released. You see the cry of the residents. This is because the NDC has not received their four million dollars uh, subsidy, which ought to come from the central government. And that's the point that I'm making. Caller, you're on the air. This will be my final call. Hi, good night. Good night. I call from Bushcat, West Coast. Also. West Coast, yes. Hey, um, when they, my wife, went to collect some... Come, 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 No, caller, you have to hurry up, man. Hi, good night. I call him to tell you about the, the old age pension people at the, at the port, you understand, eh? Uh -huh. The old age people them got and I get, never get money and when they do get money how them insult the people them the girl who are paying at the PM. Uh -huh. Tell them all kind of stuff then and you don't shit talking about Ranger, the government. And nobody don't mention up to them got it. This is for Wellington, the people who are distributing the old age pension. Yes, every time you got it. This is government take over then I get money. Two, three times the people them got it. Alright, thank you very much Carla. Yes. Thank you. Now, this caller is complaining about inadequate funds at the office at Fort Wellington that is paying old age pension. The caller is saying that several times people are turning up there, but they are not money there. And um, they are saying that people are being insulted. Please, I want the regional officials or whoever is in authority of that facility, please look into the complaint that I have received. All right. Last caller, and this is it. Caller, you're on the air. Lala. Hello? Good night, Mr. Nalala. Good night. Um, I'm calling concerning this public servant increased salary. Where are you calling from? Chesney. Chesney? Yes. Yes. Because... I hear um, a good while ago. I hear I uh, read the news and I hear about it, the salary increase to the public servant. But after you hear you not hear nothing no more. About it. I know. All right. Thank you for thank you very much, caller. This caller has raised an important point. This government said to the public servants that they will increase their salary. They said that since December that they're not going to pay a December salary increase, any back pay. They're going to wait for the budget. When the budget comes, no salary increase for public servants. They then said that they have to consult the union. Well, it is July. More than half of the year has been passed. And the public servants are not getting, have not gotten, an increase since last year. Every single year, every year, retroactively, the PVP raised public servant salary. Every single year. And retroactively, this government did not raise public servant salary for 2016. For 2015, said that they could do it year-end. When year-end 2015 came, said that they could do it in the budget. When the budget came, said that they're waiting on the union. The union came out and made it public that nobody in the government has so far 
sensibly engage them in wage talks. So that is another, apparently, another lie. Anyway, callers, this is where I have to bid you goodbye. It has been a very, very uh, packed program. We have covered a number of issues, and but time is running out as usual, or has run out, and this is where I have to bid you goodbye. Um, in closing, I want to take this opportunity once again to wish the people of the family at uh, Miami Curie Blackbush Polder who are grieving the loss of three members of that family, the father, the son, and the brother-in-law. I met with the family earlier today, earlier this evening, and I conveyed my condolences, but I want to do so on the television and on behalf of this studio, on behalf of this television station, on behalf of the People's Progressive Party, I want to convey my deeper sympathy and condolences to that uh, bereaved family again. Um, until we meet again, have a great week and a productive week so that next week we can continue our lively and constructive engagement. Thank you and good evening.